All right, our, uh, our keynote speaker. It's time. It's time. Are we set? Yeah. Um, Susan Jacoby is our keynote speaker. Uh, her, her talk is How to Define Facts When We're Not Entitled to Our Own. She's a New York Times bestseller, uh, the book The Age of American Unreason, Free Thinkers, A History of American Secularism. She's also won the Richard Dawkins Award uh, from the Atheist Alliance International. And uh, our haiku is, this is the keynote. This is today's final talk. More tomorrow. Cool. <laughs> Please welcome Susan Jacoby. Okay, everybody here? Okay. Uh, first, I want to say how honored I am to be speaking to your group. Uh, uh, no, first I want to say, uh, because I wasn't introduced, I was going to ask the introducer who said, please do not take flash pictures of me while I'm speaking, which someone is already doing. Uh, I have a thing in which I can see nothing but spots, including the notes I've made for my speech, so please don't do that. Thank you. Uh, I want to say how honored I am to be speaking to your group, which includes, among others, so many illusionists who are, shall we say, more aware than most people of the difference between facts and appearances. I also felt great at the Las Vegas airport and I realized what an honor it is to be asked to speak before this group because I was on the tram from my gate with a bunch of high school boys who apparently were having their own convention. And, and when I told them I was speaking here, they said, oh, the amazing Randy. Oh, we wish we could come. That is so cool. We've heard all about this organization, and I thought they obviously had heard about the organization, which is a great thing, because mostly 17 and 18-year-old boys haven't heard of much, so I think that's something to be <laughs> really, really proud of. Uh, uh, but I, I truly think, and this is the main point I want to stress tonight, that we need to take a closer look at what has now become a commonplace of public and political discourse which is the statement, you're entitled to your own opinions, but not to your own facts. Now, this sounds good, and I've said it myself, though I wouldn't put it in writing for reasons I'm about to elucidate. The problem, I would say the greatest problem in our public discourse on a wide variety of subjects today, is that too many Americans lack the ability to distinguish between opinions and fact. And too often, those of us who are science-oriented operate on the charming, consoling, but entirely false premise that if only we could get people to listen to evidence, they'd change their minds and see that they're wrong and we're right. Uh, this is the reason, by the way, that I never accept invitations to participate in debates about the existence of God, the validity of religion in general, or the faults and virtues of one religion in particular. Because invariably in the course of these debates, someone will come up with a passage from either the Jewish or the Christian Bible as factual evidence that something, say the chosenness of the Jewish people to rule over a particular oil-free plot of ground in the Middle East, or the appearance of a prophet named Jesus as the Messiah designated to redeem all mankind, they will say that this is not an opinion or a belief, but a fact. And at that point, it becomes impossible to debate the question precisely because one's opponent regards the historical reliability of the Bible, not as an opinion, but as a fact. This is why, and it's what's so terribly and intractably frustrating to people who think that science can decide social issues, is that this so seldom works when we try to bring arguments over what are really social or in our country religious opinions into the realm of fact. And this is true whether we're talking about fossil fuel emission, emissions and global warming or the age at which a fetus is likely to survive intact and undamaged outside its mother's womb. Science is a poor way to convince those who believe that science is just another religion. Now, we have an excellent very recent example of this phenomenon contained in a June 12th statement by Arizona Republican Representative Trent Franks that, quote, the incidence of pregnancy resulting from rape is very low. Uh, no, he said the incidents are very low. So his grasp of English grammar is very poor, and that's a fact. 
Uh, probably the best study done on this subject, published in 1996 by the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, has found that the pregnancy rate for women raped is around 5%. Since there are nearly 700,000 rapes reported to the police each year, which, as is well known, is only a percentage of the rapes that occur, we can extrapolate 35,000 pregnancies as the lowest possible number of pregnancies resulting from rapes. So there are two questions here. The first is strictly factual. Is 5% rare? Not statistically speaking. And not as any of us ordinarily think of these things in real life. That is, those of us who understand percentages. If I were to tell you all that the minute we leave this room, one out of 20 of us is going to be shot through the head the minute we get into the hall, well, I suspect everyone would sit right here in their seats until someone came around to tell us that this rare consequence of leaving the room has been rescinded. Sort of like God telling Abraham he didn't really have to sacrifice Isaac after all. The second equally important question is that even if we were to concede, which I don't for a moment, that a 5% rate of anything qualifies as rare, does that mean in a moral and ethical sense that we ignore the 35,000 women who happen to lose this particular lottery. If we believe that it is a fact and not of opinion that pregnancy resulting from rape is rare, then it's much, much easier to ignore the ethical question of what we do for women who are raped if they become pregnant. So, thank you. The mistaken fact, uh, the problem is there's nowhere to put this. Uh, okay. Okay, that's the last one. Now let me give you another example from my personal experience of the ways in which it's difficult to combat belief with facts. Uh, my last book, Never Say Die, The Myth and Marketing of the New Old Age, which was published in 2010, is one of the few books I've written in the past 10 years to get some really, really bad reviews. That's not what I'm here to talk about. Uh, but I think the reason for this was that the book conveyed a great many facts about old, old age. That is life for many people in their late 80s and 90s that run counter to the idea so beloved by baby boomers that 90 is the new 50. <laughs> I know. I wish. But the worst fact, I wish 65 was the new 50. But the worst fact in the book, one absolutely established by public health studies throughout the developed world, is that if you live to be over 55, you have a 50-50 chance of developing dementia, of which the com most common form is Alzheimer's disease. There is nothing closer to being a fact than this because it's based on studies of what is, on autopsies and the kind of custodial care that people with dementia receive in a variety of developed countries. But hardly anyone, including interestingly physicians, wanted to deal with this fact. Dr. Sherwin Newland, a very distinguished retired surgeon and an excellent writer, most of the time, dismissed what I had to say in the New Republic by writing, basically, if we behave right, we'll be all right. Now, it's understandable that Dr. Newland, who in his 80s, is in his 80s, wants to believe this. It's equally understandable that I, in my 60s, would also like to believe it, since if I behave very well, eat my vegetables, and exercise every day, I would like to think that I am not vulnerable to this terrible disease either. But it simply flies in the face of what a doctor of all people ought to know is a medical fact. Now, I could say to Dr. Newland, you're entitled to your own opinions, but not to your own facts. But he believes, he a scientist his entire life, that if you behave right, you'll be all right, because so far it's worked out for him. And thus, by a process of wish fulfillment, a belief becomes transformed into a premise for living that's very close to a fact. Uh, where, whereas the actual medical research shows, at this point, that everyone in this room who is, say, over 50, is already destined to get Alzheimer's or not. And all of the healthy eating and exercise and mental stimulation, which are valuable for their own sakes, not because they guarantee eternal health, won't keep us from that destiny. 
Now, we could find out who most of us in this age group are the unlucky ones if we were to do a brain scan of a special kind or a spinal fluid test, uh, when, because the process of Alzheimer's begins long before there are any symptoms. But what would be the point of this, given uh, that there is no effective treatment for Alzheimer's today? Through biogenetic research, I believe, there will emerge at some point in the future, more likely a means of preventing than, than treatment to slow the progress of disease. But that will be for our grandchildren, according to every specialist in this I've talked to, not for us. That's almost as close to a fact as you could get. Now, this kind of confusion between opinion and fact would be really of no importance, just another part of the human condition. If it didn't affect public decision, decisions about how we deal with serious social problems created by facts, for instance, if you do believe in the fantasy that 90 is the new 50, if you disregard the actual facts of dementia in the over 85 population, any discuss, uh, discussion of health care reform can ignore, as in fact it has and does, what is going to be an exploding need for custodial or a different kind of home care when the older baby boomers start turning 65 in less than 20 years. None of this talk about how to reduce the cost of Medicare from either liberals or conservatives addresses this train that's coming straight at us, not in centuries, not in many decades, but in less than 20 years. Because the facts are so unpleasant, we don't want to face them. Uh, in this instance, our wishful thinking that if we behave well, we'll remain well, serves the same function with regard to public policy about aging that belief in the rarity of abortion after rape serves for those who want to eliminate all abortion rights. It prevents us from moving to the ethical and social debate that is really at the heart of how we form our distinctions such as they are between opinions and facts. The question I want to put before you today and is what can be done in a society in which both specific educational deficiencies and a specifically American attachment to the supernatural, combined with the general human predilection for not wanting to hear bad news that make us downgrade or altogether ignore facts that threaten both our nation and I believe our species. Now I want to say to this group, as I say to secular humanist groups, that the one thing that's definitely not helpful is for the secular movement to divide, divide itself, say, into skeptics and humanists. And I can't tell you how happy I was to see the tables of all kinds of groups out there at this convention. Because I think this distinction between skeptics and humanists, which in my opinion, and I wouldn't say this opinion is a fact, is an essentially stupid distinction without a difference. Anyone with a working mind is skeptical about a lot of things, but not about everything. I am not skeptical about the fact that the Earth moves around the sun. Similarly, in my opinion, anyone who looks straightforwardly at facts, as straightforwardly as we imperfect beings, a little less than the angels are, capable of being, is also bound to be a humanist. Not in the sense of believing that human beings are inherently good. That would be a ridiculous rejection of facts. But in the sense that we know that we are all we've got to solve whatever problems we have. That's what being a humanist means to me. And that does not contradict being a skeptic. It goes with being a skeptic. Uh, fact, digital ro marvels, including robots, are our creation. And if we should create machines that overrule our will, which is the premise of so many current science fiction movies, that's our fault. It's not the fault of the machines. Man and woman may not be the measure of all things, but we are the only creatures who are capable of measuring things. That is a fact. If we cannot succeed in connecting scientific facts with what people see as their ordinary human problems, it does us no good to be in the right. We have to rid ourselves of the wishful thinking that says if only people knew the facts, they'd somehow approach social problems from a more reasonable standpoint. To paraphrase Bill Clinton, what does no mean?
it's actually possible for people to know deep down what they don't accept, either intellectually or philosophically, because very strict and rigid thought systems are preventing them from accepting what they actually know. Now, as a nation, uh, and it will be no surprise in this audience, I believe we're in serious intellectual trouble. A toxic mixture of anti-intellectualism, anti-rationalism, and sheer ignorance is laying waste to our culture as a whole, not just to our political culture. In 1837, in a speech known as the American Scholar Oration, which became very famous around the young nation almost as soon as it was delivered at Harvard, Ralph Waldo Emerson observed that the mind of this country taught to aim at low objects eats upon itself. Isn't that a great quote? It's a, the mind of this country taught to aim at low objects eats upon itself. Now Emerson was issuing a challenge to a young nation still engaged in building up its intellectual capital. But his words resonate much more strongly today in a society that has been engaged in dissipating its intellectual capital, except in the digital arena for decades. All of our current problems can be traced to the intellectual failings of a society that for too long has aimed its mind at low objects. Now I think there are three main characteristics distinguishing the current wave of American anti-intellectualism from the endemic forms described so well more than half a century ago by the historian Richard Hofstadter in Anti-Intellectualism in American Life. Number one is the triumph of the video culture over the culture of print, fostered by the mass infotainment media and our growing dependence on certain passive forms of entertainment. The second anti-intellectual force is the quixotic persistence and renewal of religious fundamentalism, which Hofstadter predicted when everyone said it was dead. Fundamentalism, of course, has been part of the American experience from the beginning, though it wasn't called that by that name until the 20th century. But what's different today is the dissonance between fundamentalism and the state of modern knowledge. It didn't really matter to me that many people in the 19th century believed that infectious diseases were a curse from God because there was really no knowledge in the early 19th century of the role of bacteria and no means for combating bacteria-borne diseases. But it matters very much now. The US is the only country in the developed world in which a very large minority of the population, a large, about 30%, still believes in the proof of sacred books, in the literal truth of sacred books, and will use the Bible as historical proof when they're having a debate with you. The third element shaping the American sec uh, intellectual scene today is our flawed educational system, in which I believe an unprecedented percentage of the population is exposed to at least some form of higher education, but the general public in a way knows less than our grandparents or great-grandparents did of what they needed to know when they graduated from eighth grade at the turn of the last century. All of these forces have fused anti-intellectualism with anti-rationalism in what I call junk thought. Our society is drowning in junk thought, junk thought, whose chief characteristics is imperviousness to evidence, even though it's often couch, couched in scientific language. In fact, one of the infallible signs of junk thought is either a word like Scientology that appends science to some ology, or the adjective scientific. When I lived in the Soviet Union, Communism was always called scientific communism. You can almost tell if the word scientific is appended to something in that way that it's not scientific. So what are the sources of these things, of this junk thought? Let's begin with the media. Now this is not an original observation, but for the first time in the history of man, it's possible to be connected to our video and sound equipment every minute of every hour of every day. Now I know, aggrieved eulogies for print culture and, rage, and railing against the domination of American culture by video-driven infotainment media have become so common, except no, no one, except those of us who still try to make a living from the printed word, pays any attention to critiques that could easily be titled the decline and fall of everything. Those who take a dark view of the intellectual and political consequences of the eclipse of print are obliged to establish their bona fides by showing that they love computers as much as everyone else does, and agreeing with the dubious proposition that computers are making us smarter. No, really they're not. 
That's like saying, and I apologize to the one person I mentioned this to this morning who has to hear it again. That's like saying that forks made us better eaters in the Renaissance. No, they didn't. They made us neater eaters. They made us able also to eat faster and to eat it without spilling stuff down whatever awful clothes everyone but nobles was wearing in the Renaissance. But they didn't make us better eaters. They made us faster and neater eaters. And it's the same in the digital world. But it's now become more insulting to call someone a Luddite than to call her a cheat, a drug addict, or a slut. Now, the easiest way to address the cultural, and I say that as someone who knows, <laughs> the easiest way to address the cultural ills propagated by the media without sounding like a crotchety Luddite is to focus mainly on infotainment content. And that is the tactic adopted by most consumer groups uh, dedicated to changing the media by changing the message. The assumption that content, content determines context rather than vice versa is shared by the many crusaders against relentless advertising on children's TV, violence in all television programming and video games, the brutish misogynist lyrics and images of many pop music productions and websites, and other pieces of broadcast and webcast junk too numerous to mention. Basic idea is that by eliminating certain kinds of poison, the media can be made safe for children and all living things. Now, it's of course important to mount such efforts, if only for the sake of being able to walk around with a clearer conscience about the world we're leaving for the next generation. But consider relatively recent findings indicating that the number of hours a television set is on in the average American home each day did not change measurably between the early 1980s and the turn of the millennium. What's happened, interestingly, and no one predicted it, and it happened before all of the talk about how television is getting so great now. What's happened is the digital world has not replaced the earlier forms of addictive video, but has been added on top of it. And although the digital media seems on the surface and can be more interactive than television, I would suggest and I'll be glad to make a further case for this in the Q&A period because I'm sure people will have things to say, that the fact that we're clicking a mouse during a video game is not really any more act interactive than changing a TV channel because the parameters of the game, sometimes whether we realize it or not, are set by the commercial entity that signed, designed, and sold us the game. Now, predictably, the video culture has spawned an electronic industry of scholars and writers taking up the cudgels in defense of multi-billion dollar conglomerates and poo-pooing old-fashioned intellectuals, aka curmudgeons, for their reservations about sucking at the video tit from cradle to the grave. And I do mean that almost literally. Uh, in everything bad is good for you, how today's popular culture is actually making us smarter, the author Steven Johnson acknowledges that he spends a fair amount of his own time immersed in video games but he declares that studies demonstrating the decline of reading and writing are deeply flawed because they, quote, ignore the explosion of reading and writing that has happened thanks to the rise of the internet. While conceding that email exchanges or web-based dissections of reality TV shows are not the same as literary novels, Johnson notes approvingly that both are, quote, equally text-driven, unquote. Such self-referential codswallop I have been looking for a way to use that word in a talk for quite a long while, by the way, uh, is only to be expected from a self-referential digital culture. One might as well make the statement that kitty porn and Tisha nudes are equally image-driven because they are. I challenge anyone who has ever written a regular column, as I did when I wrote The Spirited Atheist for the Washington Post on Faith website, to look at the anonymous drivel that passes as free speech and have anything good to say about the so-called explosion of anonymous writing on the internet. These were the kinds of people, when I was writing this column, who when the editors posed the question, why are women more religious than men, which is a damn good question, responded with the brilliant answer on my blog, because women are stupider than men, <laughs> without signing their names, of course. Because who would want his employer, his wife, or daughter to read that opinion? Opinion, not fact. And these people have the unmitigated chutzpah to contend that their free speech 
which risks nothing because they don't have to take any responsibility for what they say, is on a par with signing your name to the Declaration of Independence when there was a very good chance that you would be executed if you turned out to be on the losing side. So this is free speech with nothing at stake. The second important anti-rational factor in American life, resurgent fundamentalism, is ideally suited to the spread of ignorance by an ignorant media. Today's tech-savvy fundamentalists have not only become masters of their own media, but are adept at using the mainstream media, which is terrified of voicing any real criticism of religion for their own purposes. The media help drive all of this because there is a strong journalistic conviction that anything controversial, I'm beginning to hate that word, is worth covering, and that both sides of an issue must always be given equal space, even if one side really belongs in an abnormal psychology textbook. <laughs> if enough money is involved and enough people believe that two plus two equal five, the media will report the story with a straight face, always adding a qualifying paragraph noting that mathematicians, however, say that two plus two equals four. Ha, ha, ha. We know about those intellectually snobbish mathematicians. Now, too often, this perverted notion of objectivity leads mainstream news outlets to undermine logic and reason by conferring respectability on utter nonsense. A perfect example of this phenomenon was the coverage after Newtown of whether there was a need for new gun regulation. All right. I'm going to try and do something which is very hard for me, speaking and drinking water at the same time with not having a place to put the water. All right. All, all of the political debate about gun regulation was framed and reported by the mainstream media in the terms of the needs to keep guns out of the hands of the demented and the criminal without disturbing the constitutional and God-given right of law-abiding Americans to own guns. Now, I'm not saying that hunters and all those proverbial little grannies who are living in houses on the prairie and supposedly defending themselves from marauders shouldn't be able to own guns. But it seems to me that someone should have at least raised the question of whether our quasi-religious attitudes uh, toward law-abiding gun ownership actually might not have some relationship to the darker parts of the gun culture, which include not mainly mass murders, but the handiness of guns for individuals who might otherwise, had there not been a gun in their house, been able to resist the impulse to commit suicide, or little kids who don't understand about guns and wind up shooting their siblings by accidents. Uh, through all of this media non-debate, I thought of my dad, who was not an intellectual. Now, I grew up in Michigan, and nearly all of my dad's friends hunted and had guns. But dad, for whatever reason, was a premature anti-gun activist. He would get us into a lot of trouble when our next door neighbor would be dra bragging about a deer he'd shot on his last hunting trip and mounting it in what we called our rec rooms then. Say, Joe, my dad would ask, did the deer put up a good fight? Did he have an equal chance? Uh, needless to say, uh, my mother had a lot of trouble patching up the social trouble my dad made. But I kept thinking throughout all this debate about the sacredness of the right to own guns, why isn't anybody like my dad on Morning Joe? There must be some people like him. Uh, Joe is like him in the other direction. My point is here that there are all sorts of taboos, not only religion, all sorts of free information, free spaces, that free information never goes except on websites that already cater to people who agree with their views. And in no cases is more true than of supernatural beliefs. One of the most powerful taboos in American life, as we all know, is speaking ill of anyone else's faith, an injunction rooted in confusion over the difference between freedom of religion and granting religion immunity from the critical scrutiny applied to other social institutions. Now, both the Constitution and the pragmatic realities of living in a pluralistic society and join us to respect our fellow citizens' right to believe whatever they want, as long as that belief in Thomas Jefferson's memorable phrase, neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. But many Americans have misinterpreted this laissez-faire principle to mean that respects must be accorded the beliefs themselves. 
This mindless tolerance, which places observable scientific facts subject to proof on the same level as unprovable supernatural fantasy, has played a major role in the resurgence of both anti-intellectualism and anti-rationalism. Millions of Americans are perfectly free under the Constitution to believe that the Lord of Hosts is coming one day to mur murder millions of others of us who do not consider him the Messiah. But the rest of the public ought to exercise its freedom to identify such beliefs as dangerous fallacies that really do pick pockets and do break legs, and the media should not be treating them as anything else. And that brings us back. And that brings us back to junk thought, which is the product of all of the irrational and anti-rational forces in American life today. Of course, you've all heard about junk science, which has become a fashionable pejorative in recent years, and is just really a substrate group of junk thought. Uh, but it doesn't always mean what a reasonable person would expect it to mean. To scientists themselves, obviously, the phrase is generally synonymous with pseudoscience, Old and new systems of thought, like astrology, whether they attempt to explain the physical or the social universe, that can neither be proved nor disproved. Although frequently cloaked in scientific language, the leaden heart of pseudoscience is its imperviousness to evidentiary challenge. But junk science also has a politicized meaning, diametrically opposed to what real scientists believe, mean by the phrase. It's been appropriated by right-wing politicians and journalists to describe any scientific consensus that contradicts their political, economic, or cultural agenda. The internet offers a boundless array of right-wing websites, websites that pin the label junk science on everything from climatological research on global warming to studies indicating that condoms reduce the spread of sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, again, a most recent very recent example of this was the surprising evidence in a double-blind study, evidence that really amaz amazes the researchers themselves. And again, one of the differences between science and religion and science and junk science is researchers can get results they don't expect and be amazed by them and not say, oh, that can't be true because I didn't believe it was true. This evidence of a dramatic drop by more than half in sexually transmitted diseases among girls who had been vaccinated against the HPV virus, which causes genital warts and often leads to cervical cancer. Oh, that was junk science, said many right-wing websites, because the girls who were getting vaccinated were already promiscuous, by which what they mean is sexually active. Well, yes. That's what a vaccine that prevents a sexually transmitted disease is supposed to do, is to prevent you from transmitting a disease by having sex. <laughs> but of course, if your real objection is to the idea that young women are having sex, then of course you're going to be disturbed by these facts about maybe they can have sex without getting cancer later in life as punishment. But the real power of junk thought lies in its status as a centrist phenomenon, not only as a right-wing phenomenon. And this centrist phenomenon is fueled by that very credo of tolerance that places all opinions on an equal footing. We again, in the last two weeks, have had another stunning example of the mainstreaming of junk, junk thought. In Chief Justice John Roberts' opinion in validating a key section of the Voting Rights Act, in which his main argument was is that things have improved so much in voting rights in the last 15 years that we don't, 50 years, that we don't need this law anymore. Well, yes, they've improved because there was a Voting Rights Act that made them improve. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg dis dissent, which, believe me, for those of you who are young and will live to bear me out, is going to live in legal history as one of the great minority opinions in the history of the Supreme Court, correctly said that Justice Roberts' opinion was the equivalent of a person throwing away his umbrella in a rainstorm because he didn't happen to be getting wet at the moment. <laughs> what a great woman. 
but I get maybe she's religious because women are stupider than men and that's why they're religious. <laughs> the point is that junk thought isn't just something to laugh about. It's dangerous. Anti-rationalism is dangerous. And both are deadly to democracy. But what, given the tendency of all of us to repackage our opinions as facts, and skeptics and secularists are not immune to this at all, what can we do to get across to the public the distinction between evidence-based logic and junk thought? What we're not hearing nearly as much about as we need to is the responsibility of Americans themselves, not the demon entity known as Washington, for getting us into the pickle we're in through sheer laziness. Whenever I hear President Obama say the American people aren't stupid, which I know he's obliged to say, I cringe. <laughs> I think he really believes that, and it's one of his biggest mistakes as, as a political leader. Not, the American people may not be stupid. I'm not talking about stupidity in genetic sense, I'm sure you understand. But the American people are poorly educated in logical thinking. Most of them, a huge number of them, cannot distinguish between coincidence and causation, which is the essence of the scientific method, which means that their facts are all bollocksed up. Now, what might alert the public to the deeper significance of our nation's intellectual shortcomings? First, real political leadership, comparable to Franklin D. Roosevelt's effort to educate Americans in the late 1930s about their stake in the future of Europe and the threat posed by Nazism, which was not popular then either, could take advantage, what could take advantage, we could take advantage with the right political education of public anger about the wasted blood and treasure in Afghanistan and Iraq to make this a teachable moment instead of what it's being seen as now but a simple repudiation of a failed policy that people are largely tired of. But it would take awesome courage for a politician to say to voters, the problem isn't just that you were lied to, although you were. The real problem is that we as a people have become too lazy to know what we need to know to make sound public decisions. The problem is... <laughs> the problem is that two-thirds of us can't find Iraq or Afghanistan on a map. And many members of Congress, many of them are members of Congress, by the way, and they don't know a Shiite from a Sunni. And the problem is you, you voters out there, you elected these ignoramuses. You voted for them. The, promises, the problem is that most of us don't bother to read newspapers or watch the television news. Our own ignorance is our own worst enemy. It is so much easier, so much safer politically to simply say, you were the victims of a lie than to suggest that both voters and their elected representatives must shoulder much of the blame for their own willingness to be deceived. It's easy to imagine the chorus of sneers from ignorant talking heads on cable news if a presidential candidate or office holder dared to use the word ignorance in public. But political leadership is a symptom, not a cause of our cultural decline. And if there is any way to resist the worst aspects of our culture today, to battle against what I call a culture of distraction, it can only be created one person at a time, one citizen at a time, one family at a time, by parents and citizens determined to preserve a saving remnant of those who prize memory and, prize memory and true learning above everything else. And that is where everyone in this room has a special responsibility. I stress the role of parents mainly because it's only in early childhood that parents can, to some extent, control their children's access to poisonous infotainment, like poisonous food. Adult self-control, not digital parental controls on computers, which any computer literate 10-year-old can get around easily, and if you think otherwise, your children have been deceiving you very effectively is the chief requirement for the transmission of his individual and historical memory. A parent who sets, sits down in front of the TV after dinner every might, night while monitoring their children's computer use to make sure that their homework is done before they go online is sending not a mixed message but a thoroughly negative message about books. Screen time of whatever sort is the reward for children who have completed all of those boring Gutenberg era chores. I know that I became a reader in childhood because my parents read. They watched television too, of course, 
But books were what always seemed to me like passports to the adult world. The endless warning about the dangers for too much scream time for the young evade the fact that today's children are simply following their parents' footsteps, or more to the point, sinking into the spreading and round indentations their parents left, have left on the couch. <laughs> Anyone who, valued self, who values self-reliance will be changed for the better by limited scream time for themselves as well as their children. And there is no way for parents, apart from the fourth ex force of example, to raise children whose minds are not absolutely enthralled to commercially generated images. And I mentioned parents for another vital reason. One of the best things groups can do, the essential thing, is to be involved with education at the local and state level. Everybody here who has a kid in a public school, and everybody who doesn't, needs to go home and become the scourge of school boards, really on everything having to do with the substitution of opinion for, for fact. I recently received a letter from a man named James McCollum, the father of a forgotten figure, forgotten figure, perhaps not by this group, but generally forgotten in 20th century secular history named Vashti McCollum. Back in 1948, Vashti sued the school board of Peoria in the state of Illinois because the state had a law allowing release time for instruction in religion for school children. The children who didn't take advantage of this and go off to the Catholic Church or the temple for instruction were put in a special room in the public school and stigmatized. In 1948, the Supreme Court decided in favor of Vashti McCollum, who had been fired by the University of Illinois and had her cat lynched, among other charming behaviors, for the stand she took against release time for religious instruction. At the very least, we ought to all be standing up at the local and state board of education level on all of these issues, on everything from evolution to the teaching of the secular aspects of our nation's history. When your state school board does what the Texas school board does and replaces Thomas Jefferson with Thomas Aquinas among people who influenced revolutions, people like us ought to be there. Just talking about science, just talking about science in convention halls with other people who agree with us is not going to cut it. I like to call myself a cultural conservationist as distinct from a cultural conservative. And a cultural conservationist in today's America can only act in hope while living with amply justified fear. What each of us needs to strive for, I believe, is a combination of the fact-based argument and the passion for humanity that was embodied by my 19th century hero, Robert Ingersoll. So I want to close with a passage from Ingersoll's eulogy for Walt Whitman, Whitman, in which he combined his defense of naturalism and science with his humanism. Of Whitman, Ingersoll said, he was absolutely true to himself. He had frankness and courage, and he was candid as light. Frank, candid, pure, serene, noble, and yet for years he was maligned and slandered simply because he had the candor of nature. He will be understood yet, and for that which he was condemned, and that for which he was condemned, will add to the glory and greatness of his fame. Whitman wrote a liturgy for mankind. He wrote a great and splendid psalm of life, and he gave to us the gospel of humanity the greatest gospel that can be preached, unquote. It should be our task to expend every last bit of effort in the cause of convincing people that science and a naturalistic approach to the world, far from being the enemy of our deepest emotions and passions as human beings, are in fact the fulfillment of our most noble dreams not only about the scientific tools we want to invent to further, pro further human progress, but, but about the kind of human beings we want to become. The kind of people like Robert Ingersoll, who said of Whitman, he wrote a great and splendid psalm of life and gave to us the gospel of humanity, the greatest gospel it can be preached. Thank you. 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 Okay.
Yes, indeed. We have time for a few questions. If we want to line up right over here. I've got a bum knee. I fell off a stage with moving steps a year ago. The steps were attached at the side, and they, did, and they moved, and my knee didn't move with them. If anyone has a question, come on up. We have uh, about 10 minutes for questions. Yeah. Let me change to my distance glasses just so I can see you people. We'll have you right here. Okay, first question. Let's do as many anyone as we can. All? Here we go. You got one? Hi. So I agree with a lot of what you said, but I think there's a lot that's worth exploring in, in some of the new stuff that's appearing. Like there's a lot of games like some of you might recognize Minecraft, where it's, it's sort of open-ended and creative rather than you're playing through a script. And there's other stuff like 3D printers that are appearing that allow people to experiment with like, you know, physical stuff and that it's a creative process. So do you think that sort of stuff has worth in this yes. process? Yes, I don't mean to imply that all of these things don't have worth. I think the things you're talking about particularly the 3D thing in, in which all kinds of creative things and scary things too can be invented. I'm not saying that these things are worthless. I think like all things, our time is limited. And if what we do is spend, let's say, let's say j just for the sake of silly argument, we have 12 hours of free time a day. If we spend 11 and a half of it with screen time, that doesn't leave much time for anything else. And I think one of the things about thinking and logic and deep concentration is, is that you can't be looking at a screen and do it. And I think that's true of the best, the best of the digital world as well as the worst. And I think that one of the things that, has to be, that, that one has to be cognizant of is you can have too much of a good thing. I'm not sure that sitting and reading Dostoevsky all day is a great idea either. There are a lot of elements in knowledge and we've gone overboard on, on just the technological part of it. That's my opinion. Hello, uh, a kind of follow up to that question in a sense. Um, given that the internet is unlikely to go away. <laughs> sure, um, I wouldn't want it to. Uh, and, I, and I totally agree with you on the value of non-screen time based activities, but what in your opinion is the end game for you know, a culture which is based on kind of mass consumption of a text based medium and, and video and so on, but via the internet? And also, how would you propose to insulate or you know, inoculate society against the worst evils that could be wrought by such a, a future situation? Oh dear, uh, that, qu that question is always asked. Well, first of all, of course, I don't know what the end game is any more than anyone does. But inoculation has to realize, and, and again, it, it is why I do stress the role of parents. I think that kids have to learn what concentration is at an early age. And by that, I don't mean, there's no such thing as inoculating anybody against the internet. As somebody in her 60s, I mean, I can tell you that the web is as big a temptation from things that I consider slightly more important or a lot more important as it is for me as it is for, as it is for a 16-year-old. Uh, one of the reasons I work in a special writer's room at the New York Public Library is it enables me to detach myself from the web for the hours I'm working there. I get roughly three times as writing done because what do I do at home when I get stuck in my writing? Which is my main job, that's what I do. I write books, I research. When I get stuck at home, I go on the internet and tell myself I'm doing research. Right, I'm doing research. I'm going, I'm going to a website to see what the Huff Post says today, or to see, or to see what I saw today when I, when, I, when I turned on the computer and saw that the Iowa State Supreme Court had upheld a decision saying male bosses can fire women for being too attractive and threatening their marriages. <laughs> or, what, or, or, then, or then, of course, I can wind up on a site selling Italian shoes. What I am not doing when I am on the internet as a writer is concentrating and, and doing the kind of concentration that I need to do to write a book. The internet has about as much value when I go on it to avoid writing as standing in front of the fridge eating ice cream, which I also do to avoid writing goes. <laughs> and which is why I think that one of the answers, I don't know what the end game is, but I know that small children have to be given time to develop some responses 
to a way of thinking and a way of looking at the world through having parents read to them that is not based on a screen in their face. And the fact that now roughly 50% of American two-year-olds and a very much higher percentage of those in higher income homes have TVs and, or screens in their room when they're under two is, is a telling thing about what we're not doing. As to what the end game is, I won't be around to see it. Maybe you won't either. <laughs> Hi, um, I agree with what you're saying. Sometimes people use facts so that they can pull you into uh, their agenda. Uh, I like the example you use saying, you know, how very little uh, women get pregnant from um, rape and, and, and that's to pull you into the anti-abortion ideal system. Are there any tools that we can use so we don't like fall like blindly f other than obvious, you know, critical thinking skeptic tools um, to um, kind of not fall into people's agendas while looking at figures or facts. Did everybody hear that question? Because I think it's a really important question. Uh, did everybody, everybody hear that? Okay. Uh, I, I think that is actually the most important question. And I do think that one of the things we have to do uh, in talking about anything that's dear to our hearts and minds, is we have, to, we have to be able to show people how scientific facts, far from being threatening to, I, you know, I think, I think everybody wants to be happy. Everybody with children, I really believe, wants to see their children do better than they do. And I think that one of the things that's wrong with America today is a lot of people are very fearful that their children won't do better than they do. I think we have to make an effort. And, 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 and writing books and developing software alone isn't enough. Uh, I, think, I, I actually think there need to be, in a way, workshops about, from people who are effective at talking to people about how to talk to people without, and, and make them realize that these issues have something to do with their personal life. Look, we were just laughing in the presenter's room about this, uh, about this new sci-fi made for TV movie, Sharknado, I believe it's called. <laughs> I don't think I need to tell anybody in this room about it. The way, the way junk information moves fast. We've all seen pictures of the sharks falling off the water on top of the Empire State Building already. But people, people can pick up ridiculous stuff so fast. And why? It seems to touch a chord. And I think one of the things, one of the reasons I read Ingersoll's eulogy from Walt Whitman is I think one of the things we have to do is, and I wrote this in an essay for the New York Times after Newtown, is we have to make people understand that certain, certain, let's say, scientific facts, such as that the main use of guns in homicides is suicide, not homicide of another person. I think we have to show people how these issues, which are subject to scientific research, relate to things that may and could happen in their own lives and have hurt them. And by the way, I think a model for this, and I, I also think, by the way, those of us who are atheists also need to come out with atheists and show that, you know, atheists are nice, atheists are nice people, atheists are good people, atheists don't have horns on top of their heads, because I believe that the gay rights movement has had an extraordinary success success faster than I have ever seen in my lifetime in any cause, because of coming out, and this is a unique thing, in that a lot of people who thought of gays as something out there, something evil people who had nothing to do with them, were made to realize that gay people were their sons and daughters, they were the neighbor down the block, they were people they worked with, they were their, they were their boss, they were maybe even their minister. And I think we've got to make people realize that science and evidence-oriented people and or atheists, we're not just, we're not, we're, not, we're not people with horns. We are their brothers and their sisters and their daughters. And not confront them, but talk to them about how these issues affect them where they live and how it affects us where we live. The most letters, emails I ever got for a piece 
was when I wrote a piece when I mentioned about how my, when my partner died of Alzheimer's five years ago, but how was, I was never more glad to be an atheist in my life. Because I've, I had had to do what a religious person had to do, which is ask that theodicy question, how a merciful God can allow this. I don't see how I could have gone on living. I got more emails from people, both religious and non-religious people, praising me for that question, not because it was such a great, brilliant, or original idea on my part, but because it related atheism to something that they could relate to. That, unfortunately, is our time. Oh, okay. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, our keynote speaker, Susan Jacoby. You've been a great audience. Uh, uh, I should say, I'm going out to sign a book, but I'll be about five minutes after a break. But I am, I am coming. And also, people have even asked me, will I sign old books? Yes, I will sign old books. I can't believe there are authors who listen All right. Don't forget tonight. SGU dinner, uh, Satiristas, and the Pan uh, Bacon Donut Party. All right, kids. Who needs sleep, right? We'll see you tomorrow.